Welcome to the Transform My Dance Studio podcast, powered by the Dance Studio Owners Association. We are thrilled to be welcoming back Jody Schilling and Angela Manella Hoffman as our guest hosts in a brand new season of Elevate Your Studio. This very special series will give you an inside look into how Jody and Angela have grown their dance studios as they share their tips on building a thriving business while getting their life back. Jody and Angela are the owners of Releve Studios in California and more than dance in Minnesota. Now, let's get on with the show. Elevate your studio with Jody and Angela. Welcome to Elevate Your Studio, finding the joy in studio ownership. I'm Angela. And I'm Jody. And we are so thrilled to be back for our third episode of our third season. I can't Lucky believe number- we're like halfway through our third season already. Yeah, so much has changed in the world, hasn't it? It really has. And if you haven't caught our first two episodes, uh, we liked them. <laughs> They're pretty yeah, good. We too. We hope you did too. But today we're going to talk a lot about identifying your studio and the five important questions you can ask yourself about your studio. Because don't people always ask you, like, well, what's your studio about or things like that, Jody? Yeah, and I get a lot of questions about how have I grown so quickly and uh, mm-hmm. why does everything work so smoothly and why are, how are you so clear about what you want? And, and I think it's right. because of these five questions. Absolutely, absolutely. So the biggest one, I think, is the first one. I it's agree. Really, it's really important as a studio to identify your mission, your vision, and your values. Yes. So I know we have similar values in our studios, but every studio is different and they have different values. So you want to know what yours are. Yeah, it's it's going to be the thing that sets you apart from every other studio because we're all we're all teaching performing arts, we're all teaching yeah. dance. And and even within that like you and I both have like sort of a wholesome quality to our studio. Yeah. But unless you're super clear on what wholesome means to you, I mean, wholesome to one person might be something totally, totally different, different to someone else, right? The same yeah. thing, like we have one of our values is, um, uh, I think of a good one that would would be a, a good example, adventurously creative is one of our examples. Well, that's going to mean something different to different teachers. So you had to get very, very clear with them, what is adventurously creative? Because you don't, you know, you don't want to end up with something in left field, but you Absolutely. also want to push it, you know, the creativity. I put my um, values up in our studio, like our core values. We have about eight of them. To where do you post yours? I mean, I have it in the studio, on Facebook, everywhere we kind of, it's a big part of our studio. It's, I I can almost guarantee you that Every single person at our studio knows our mission yeah, because it's that apparent. Good. And then I am pretty sure every staff member can rattle off the, the eight values that we have and even the vision, our three-year vision. But it's, we have it on our studio walls. It's in, mm-hmm. uh, it's in the teacher's handbook. It's in every hiring document I send out. Yeah, It's covered at every meeting. It's uh, in our company handbook for like our teams. It's on social media. It's on our website. It's pretty much everywhere. I found that people come into our studio to register and will say like, oh, I've heard that you're very family friendly and wholesome. Like even before I say a word or before anything, they know already because our brand identity is strong. And we've worked on that so much within our studios. Yeah, we 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 get known as like we're very um, meticulous and and um, all our ducks are in a row. row. So sure. they know when they walk in that our communication is going to be really clear. So so our eight just to rattle them off, and yours might be different, but this will just give you an idea that mm-hmm. that might help help you. Ours is growth mindset, uh, resourceful problem solving, collaboration, freedom within a framework. Uh, to deliver amazing experiences, adventurously creative, enjoying the journey, and then finally um, creating huge goals and dreaming radically. So those are our eight. And it it definitely fits our personality as a a studio. 
Absolutely. And mine, I have some of the same ones, but when, then I also have um, joy and creativity because that's really important to us and then divine value. So mm-hmm. we want all of our students to see that they have a higher power within them. So those are, you know, things that people know about us, which is great. But how did you come up with your core vision and your uh, core um, values? The core values initially I came up with the the first draft of them. But mm-hmm. then in a teacher's retreat meeting that we had one August, we we sat down, all of us, all 20 of us, and we hashed them out even further. And they got tweaked so that the, the teachers had value and, and some say into what they were being a part of. But ultimately, I made the final decision because it's my company, but I gave them some say-so. Right. And I think if you're going to start doing it, which I think everybody should, just to even brainstorm things that people have said about you, things that you value, and then go from there to try to make them into a concise list. Yeah. With a little explanation, but just go for it. Just start brainstorming and writing down all of the things that you feel about your business or what you want to accomplish. And I think on your mission statement, you know, a lot of people have about a paragraph that they write out, but I think that it's super helpful to have like a quick tagline or slogan yes. uh, so that everyone gets the gist of it in just a few yes. words. So like ours is always, we, everyone in the studio can recite uh, Releve means to lift up and that's what Releve does we lift up our students. Every single parent knows that. And I think that's kind of cool. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. And ours is wholesome and family friendly performing arts training. And like everybody knows that you just, yep. (laughs) and it's funny because your clients start to, to do the advertising for you. Yes, They will say what, you know, what you want them to. So that's great. I think that everybody, if you haven't done that yet, Start trying to find a a way to do that, to just get out those core values and your mission, make it really clear and check it every couple months because maybe it's changed throughout the season. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So then I think one of the things that is really important to know about your studio is who is your customer? Who do you want in your doors? I always think this is kind of confusing because dance studios sort of have two customers. You've got the parents And you've got the student. Yeah, and then absolutely. I used to get confused. Well, who's the primary? Like, you know how there's primary customers and secondary yep. customers? I, for a long time, had it flipped. I had that the student was the primary customer and the parent was sort of the secondary. But no. Yeah. It's, <laughs> oh, yeah. And when I made that flip, like, it's the person who has the money who is absolutely. your primary customer. So... So I'm not targeting kids on Facebook. I am targeting the parents. Yeah. And and, and not all parents are alike. No, not at all. <laughs> and they don't have the same wants for their child. But I think you do have to advertise to the kids, especially when they come into the studio and into the space to make sure that, you know, they tell their parents, oh, I really want to do this. But oh, exactly. Yeah. I yeah, the secondary, the secondary customer is the student. So you want to make sure they're happy in class and they're having fun and they're growing. Right. That is going to make the parent happy. But when you're initially reaching out to target new students, it's going to be the parent or sometimes the grandparent or, or whatever. You know what I found interesting is when what? I moved from just 12 minutes north in Los Angeles, my parent avatar completely changed. Really? It did. Wow. The that's pa- fascinating. The parents that I'm attracting now are totally different. So when we say different, so for me, my, I have some, like I have about three different sections of parents that I kind of categorize into avatars. Like you said, like the parent that really wants their kid to go for a professional career is mm-hmm. willing to do whatever. There's also the parent who wants something that is going to be uplifting to their kid. And, you know, and then there's the parent who wants an activity for them to do. Mm-hmm. So I think you have to have those different avatars and reach out to them in different ways if you want to really retain them. 
I think you're absolutely right. And then the same thing for the kids, your secondary customer, there are different types of students as well. And yeah. which one are you going to be targeting? And, and it gets really complicated when the student <laughs> and the parent are all mismatched. Yeah. <laughs> you may have a parent who wants their child to be a star and that little student really doesn't want to dance at all. No, and I think it's really important to have your marketing reflect all of those different types, your branding reflect those different types, even the way that your front desk staff talks to the customers. I mean, Jody, you're so great about having different ways that you can talk to people um, when they come into the door. Do you want to share some of that, a little bit of that information? Sure. I, I did. I shared it at an inner circle retreat recently that there's basically four different types of customers. And when they they walk in the door, if you can identify who they are quickly, then it just helps the conversation flow uh, a little bit easier. And maybe that's a like that's a whole podcast actually oh, to go into that. Absolutely. But basically, yeah. you know, there's there are most books will tell you there's four four types of customers. And, and so I've given my front desk staff a tool that will help them identify uh, who this, who, who they're talking to quickly so that they know how to gear the sales pitch. Yeah. And I think just explaining that is great because I always felt kind of bad, like putting people into categories, (laughs) you know what I mean? Because it's like all of the really, like the traits that you, that people really aren't, but there's aspects of them. Yeah. Am I making that like, I can't think of the word, but it's very, oh, stereotypical. It's like a very stereotypical. So at first I was feeling really bad about like pigeonholing people into these different kind of categories. But once you start doing it and realize that they want something different, that Mm -hmm. they, you know, something that is valuable to them may not be valuable to somebody else. So if you can tap into that, it's like a secret language. It's really it cool. Is. It's like a code. And if you can break yeah. the code, then that's when when you start converting and getting more students. It's pretty cool. And then also yeah. just realizing, yes, you're categorizing people, but people are kind of like a hybrid. Like there, there's right. they have predominant traits and secondary traits and even third traits. Like, I'm an introvert, highly introverted, but I can also co-host a podcast. Yeah, you know no, I mean? so and it's not like you're going to have a checklist for each person. Well, do you fall into number A, B? Exactly. You know what I mean. So, but right. it's just nice to have kind of an idea. So, what happened? Oh, oh I was going to just say I'm I'm kind of bad though. I I sort of in my brain categorize people all the time throughout I my whole day. Maybe it's being an actor and we've had to like look at people and their personalities oh, yeah. right away. But I always do that. I always kind of categorize people and their actions and things. Not in a bad way, but just no, for just observing. It was just yeah. being observant. Yes. So what's the third question everyone should ask about their studio? Mm-hmm. Well, we kind of talked about it a little bit, but the third question is, what does your customer value? Do they value exercise for their child? Do they value a place where their child can belong? You know, what are those different things that they value and how can you reach them at that visceral level? You know what the better question is? Sure. Is, does their values align with your values? Like going that, back yeah. to question, the question number one, because if they're if they're not identifying with your values, then it's sort of a mute point. They won't be the right fit. And we both had students in our studios who you just butt heads with in every single situation. Nothing's good enough. Nothing, and it comes down to what that parent values. It is probably not the same as what you value in your studio. And sometimes, well, most of the time, it's okay to let those people go. Yeah. The first time I had an exodus of, (laughs) (laughs) have we all been through this? I think so. If you haven't, it's coming. (laughs) It's it's inevitable. Um, We had an exodus of, of competition team students one year 
And it was, it was a ton of money walking out the door. And when I was holding on to them so hard, like doing everything I could to like appease these people that I just couldn't please because they weren't aligned. They were not the right fit for my studio. And then meanwhile, they they weren't the right fit for the next two studios they tried either, but that's okay. That's another story. But don't be afraid to let people leave that aren't the right fit because my goodness, like we suddenly grew when they were gone because the, the, they, they didn't fit. So they were repelling the people that did fit. It's kind of like the um, Winkies and the Wizard of Oz when the witch dies and they're like, thank you. You know, so the that, what? The, the Winkies? Winkies? You know, the guys who say, oh, hey, oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> Is that so what they were called? Yeah. Yeah. That's what they're called. Okay. It's like how they, you know, how the, Dorothy thought they would be so angry and they were so relieved. Like I found that with our students and their families, like once we let go of the dead weight, the yes. other people were like, thank you. We've been, you know, so yeah. it's like a breath, a, a breath of fresh air. And, and, and also when you get those, those amazing people who are like mavens yes. and, and like everyone gravitates towards that to them. And they're like, they, they it's like, they've always belonged to your studio. Like they found yes. their home and, and, and then they'll advertise for you. I mean, exactly. You just, and then you can spend your time really focusing on the things that matter and not feeling bad every day about going into your studio or that any decision you make, somebody's trying to catch you on it or something yeah. like that. Something that I've learned with customer values is you cannot assume that you know their values. You have to ask. <laughs> yes. 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 Because I think everyone thinks like me. And oh, absolutely. It's not true. <laughs> I have to remind myself, Jody. not everyone thinks like you or has and, the same values. And people aren't generally afraid to talk about themselves if you ask them the right way. Like I always thought, oh, you know, nobody's going to say like, I value this or blah, blah. But if you get the right way to ask them, they'll open up and reveal part of that secret code we were talking about. Yes. Well, the other thing on this, on this topic before we move on is yeah. once... Uh, once you know what their values are, if you can maximize your ability to satisfy their particular needs, yeah. then that's that is gold. So, so like an example, the parent who who just wants something for their kid to do because they need a break, right? If you can come up with like the best summer camp or, you know, whatever it is that satisfies their need, they're going to keep purchasing from you because you, you've hit it on the head exactly what they need and want. Right. But one thing I want to make sure is that you don't ever do that at the risk of your own values. Sometimes, especially starting out as a studio owner, you need all the money coming in and things, and you can spend so much time appeasing people that you lose sight of your own values. So I think that's what's so um, genius about you, Jody, is that you know how to figure that out from people. Which yeah. Well, you want to, you, you, you always, always have to keep in mind your company's values and then yeah. see how your customer, customer values align with that. And then where it aligns is what you focus on. It's great. Brilliant. Love it. Okay, what's, Love what's the fourth one? What's the fourth one? The fourth one is what are your studio's results? like your long-term, short-term results? What do you measure? Things like that. I used to be so bad at measuring <laughs> statistics and numbers and KPIs and all that stuff. And I honestly did not do it until I met Clint Salter. Oh, yes. Remember when we first joined the Inner Circle and there was this, this like Google Doc that we had to fill out like I think it was every week and it was such yes. a pain in the butt because it asked you oh, like every number you could possibly think of you had to fill out right. to measure. Do you remember right. that? Oh, I totally do because it gave me nightmare <laughs> <laughs> because I'm not like a numbers quantitative, you know, I'm not that type of person and I have a hard time looking backwards. Like right. I'm always on the next thing. So yes, I remember that period of time and it was so good because it pushed us so much, but I yeah. literally had nightmares. Of yeah, it, my it, it was a lot, a lot of numbers that I don't track personally. Other people are tracking some of right. those numbers now. 
I know like the 10 key items I'm looking at every yeah. single week to just make sure that there's, um, you know, growth happening or, or whatever. But what, what are some of the, the things that you are tracking? Well, I track our student numbers, not just how many students we have registered, but how many are returning. Mm-hmm. Um, I track the different age groups mm-hmm. and what the retention rate is with that. Um, we've really had to work. We've been really good about attracting students, but we've had to work pretty hard on retaining them, especially because we have so many little, little kids. Yes. Um, so that's been a huge one for me. How about you? What are some of your numbers? Um, in We use QuickBooks and I uh-huh. find it very helpful to do month to month comparisons. That's so great. previous month and the next month, but also year to year comparisons. So if you look at um, so we're in May. What does May 2020? <laughs> <laughs> it's almost hilarious to say it look like in comparison to May 2019. You guys, a uh, little bit of a reveal. It doesn't look very good. <laughs> well, I just think it's so funny because before all this COVID came about and things, I was finally feeling like, yes, I kind of have a handle on stuff. I know. I know I'm doing a little bit, but it's yes. Like, it's like a cruel joke that universe oh. plays. You <laughs> start to like succeed and then wham, COVID-19. Yes. yes. It, t- it takes a pandemic. But, you know, some of the um, studio processing software has that on there. Like I use Studio Director and they have the year to date, the month to date. Mm-hmm. It's really nice to look every Monday. Yeah. Sometimes. Dance Studio Pro also has some really, really great reports awesome. uh, that you can check out. Okay. Yeah. We're ready for our question number five. Number five is what is your plan for your studio? Like, how do you decide your goals? How do you create action steps? Where do you want to go with the studio? I love this stuff. I do too, because it's so like, you get to imagine. Yeah, it, I don't know why. Maybe it's because we're CEOs and visionaries yeah. that this is the part that I really love. I don't love the tracking part that we were just talking <laughs> about. <laughs> That's better for my studio manager. But this... uh visionary work and the setting the goals. That is the stuff that I love. Well, and how do you set your goals? Like Clint has us do a three-year plan, a five-year plan. What, what do you find working the best? I find vision boards for me work the best because I need to see visually. How about you? Yeah, I, actually it's funny because I did a vision board three years ago oh, and, yeah. and I kept it. <laughs> I kept it every year because I hadn't achieved it all. It's like, sure. I'll make one and I'm like, no, I'm going to get everything on this vision board done. And and I just realized that I finally accomplished everything on that that stupid vision oh, board and I have to make another that. one. <laughs> that makes me so happy. That's like, no. I found goal lists that I had for the studio from like four years ago, one time when I was like reorganizing and those things came true. And thinking back, like if I could have, thought that I would have what I have now, it would have just been amazing. And it is amazing, but it's just, it's so good to have those goals and have them written or have them seen or something. Yeah. There's, there's exercises that you can do to get, get those juices flowing with like, what, what do you, what do what do you, sometimes it's even hard to set a goal. Like it's just overwhelming. And like, how do you piece it down? So sometimes you have to back up and be like, well, what's my budget? Sure. (laughs) Or, or, um, what's the objective? Like, yeah. What do I want? Before you even set a goal, what's your objective? When I think it's, it's important to not to judge yourself. Like it's so easy to start editing right away, but just let it all out and then start to compartmentalize and edit and think about it. We stop ourselves so much in just the thinking, oh, that's never going to happen or whatever. And I think also if, if you're not accustomed, accustomed to achieving goals, Mm -hmm. like you just, you set a goal, but you don't really take actionable steps towards it. It sort of makes you feel like, well, why even set them? Right. Yeah. Yeah. But once you get in the habit of making strides towards reaching a goal and you actually reach your first few, then you're like, this stuff works. Well, and I think it's great too, because 
when we've been, since we've been in the inner circle, we don't have a million goals each quarter. We have three mm-hmm. specific goals with specific mm-hmm. plans. Like I used to have 8 million goals, you know, and then think, well, why didn't I get any of them done? Because it was mm-hmm. too scattered. Like we really have to hone in on just a few things and find a plan to get those finished. Yeah. Clint always says less is more. And yeah. I used to kind of laugh at that. And I'm like, no, more is more. Have you not had a, a banana split before? You want more right. ice cream exactly. and more chocolate and, you know. Or a no. drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a, yes. So also with the goal setting and, and, You've heard people talk about smart goals or different ways of setting goals. Yeah. The more specific you are, the better. And the more you can break down those, let's say you're setting three goals, the more you can break down each of those into teeny tiny steps and right. disperse you can that throughout your, your week and your day and your month, then the, the more likely you'll be able to. to yeah. I think it's really important, really important. And one thing that we um, can't remember who the author was, but talking about how planning those out the day ahead of time or the week ahead of time, like if you have specific goals, what I used to do was just get to my office, sit down at my desk and be like, okay, what are my plans for today? But Mm -hmm. planning out your day ahead of time so that you're ready just to start when the day arrives. You and I both use uh, the Daily Greatness Business Journal. Yeah, and I love it. I've been doing it for about five years. It's this gigantic book that I write in every single day. I look at it every single hour, almost during my workday, to make sure that I am hitting every single uh, goal and time blocking accordingly. So that you know, now I've got to juggle homeschool with. with right with my children, which is so hard. (laughs) Oh, and I think everybody is just, you know, we're all struggling with all of this right now. And I think if you can, even if it's something like giving yourself a goal to work out that day and you accomplish that one little thing, Mm -hmm. fantastic, celebrate it. And then add another goal. Just keep moving forward. This was so good. Let's do a quick recap of our our five questions. Great. So So the, the first one, what was it? It was, what is our mission and values? Yes. Clearly define those. Second was, who is your customer? You've got a primary and a supportive customer base. Yep. Third is, what is your customer value? And is it aligned with your values? So good. Don't assume it. Just ask it. Mm -hmm. Four. What are your result, results? How are you measuring everything? And are you looking at, at it every single day? And then number five is what is your plan? What, what do you dream of? What, how are you going to get there? And you know, something that informs your plan is that what you just measured. So if right. what you just measured is not up to snuff, <laughs> then your plan, your plan's going to change. Or if it's going really great, you might want to double down on that, on that revenue stream that is taking off like, like crazy. So a plan is not a dream. A dream is something you think about. The plan is how you get there. And yeah, it's, that's, that's deep. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Jody. This was really fun. This was fun, Angela. I, I can't wait. Uh, I can't wait for our next one. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for listening. Please, if you need help defining your values or your mission, email us. We would love to help you and kind of direct you if you have some questions and things like that. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Elevate Your Studio on the Transform My Dance Studio podcast. You can learn more about Jody and Angela plus the the behind-the-scenes stories from 19 other successful dance studio owners from around the globe in our brand-new book, Dance Studio Secrets. 65 Ways to Build a Thriving Studio is now available on Kindle and paperback from Amazon.com. See you next week for a new episode with our special guest hosts.